The Yahud, they came and they saw, because they used to go around the Arab. The Yahud, they used to go to the different places. They were looking for the last prophet. They saw this child and they were men and they had weapons. And this was Halima by herself. Harat was not with her. And in the Bedouin, the men would go out and they would have their own things they would do. So she was by her. They didn't have hijab and all this stuff at the time. So when they saw her and they saw him, والسلام, they saw on him the signs that were in their books for the last prophet. So they started to question her. They, they asked about this child and she gave answers until they said, kill him. But they, now she was not able to stop them, right? But they said one more question. They said, is he an orphan? So she lied. She said, no. This is my son. What are you talking about orphan? Right? They said, okay, leave him. Because one of the signs we have is that he would be an orphan. And if he's not an orphan, and this lady has told us all the answers truthfully, so they trusted her, so they let her go. Now this is a mursal rawaya, but to know the background. But this is why yeah, Ibn Ishaq and others says, after this, Halima said, let me take him back. Because she was afraid for him, and she loved him. She said, I saw the best of akhlaq even as a little child. I saw him develop very fast. He was very intelligent. He was very quick to understand things. But she wanted to take him back. When she took him back, she couldn't give him up. She took him to Mecca, but then she told Amina, if you don't mind, let him stay with me a little bit longer. Amina, she loved her child. She wanted the child back, but she said, you know, Halima, she begged and she asked, she said, okay, keep him for a little longer. And then inshallah, I'll, I'll ask him to be come back to me. Here, when she went back, a, a very clear Sahih Hadith. It's reported in Sahih Muslim, in Kitab Al-Iman, from Anas ibn Malik, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and in many other books of Hadith, and every book of Tariq has, is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was out grazing the goats and playing. And the children, they would go out, they would be taking care of the goats and things, but they would also play with Abdullah, the son of Halima, and uh, Shayma, not Shayba, but Shayma, she was one of the daughters, and Unaysa, she was also one of the daughters of Halima. They were all little kids, they were playing, and this is Khilaf of Ulema, of course. As we mentioned, these are not, we don't have dates here, right? we don't have 1942 and 1962. So the, the, the years, there is some Khilaf. Some of the ulema said the second, fourth, sixth, so on. But what is correct? What I found to be correct is the fourth year of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was about four years of age. At this time, they were playing and then the children saw a stranger, an angel. They didn't know it was an angel. They just saw a stranger. Come and take the Prophet ﷺ and lay him down. And cut open his chest. Now the Prophet ﷺ is not screaming. He's not yelling. He's not out there, you know, having a fit. He's calm. Now the children, they see this and they run. And what are they going to do? They run home to Halima and they said, Verily, uh, Muhammad. Yani Muhammad has been killed. At this, Halima, she became very afraid. She went out to where the Prophet ﷺ was, where the children took her. What the children saw, and the Prophet ﷺ himself narrates, is that a man came and he cut open the chest and took out the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. Now the children ran away at this point, but they saw this, they're witnesses, eyewitnesses. Right? The Prophet ﷺ himself explains this in the Rara and Sahih Muslim. Anas ibn Malik, he reports on the Prophet ﷺ that this was Jibreel. And he came and he opened the chest of the Prophet ﷺ, took out his heart and washed it in a basin of gold that had the water of Zamzam, with the water of Zamzam. And took out from his heart something and told him, this was the portion of shaitan in your heart that every insan has. Tell you a few points here. We as Muslims obviously believe this. Why? We have clear sahih ahadith on this. It's also in the Quran, clear ayah in the Quran. So no doubt we believe this. Right? I was reading one of the Orientalists, the Orientalists, you know, those that study Islam to kind of harm Islam, and then some of our shiuk then go study with. So 
uh, one of the Orientalists, and this is يعني, uh, from the 1800s, he wrote and he said, look at the uh, foolishness of the Muslim belief. Like he was mocking it. He said, they said that a heart could be taken out of the chest and put back in. That's impossible. We know that if a heart is taken out, the person dies. يعني? So the Islamic belief is unscientific. But now today, doctors perform open heart surgery. They take hearts out and put hearts in and replace people's hearts with pig hearts and machines. And now we see it. Now we see it. And when the doctors do it and tell us, how many of you personally with your own eyes witnessed a heart being taken out? You were in the operation theater where the heart, you physically saw it come out. How many? Raise your hands. None of you. Do you believe it happens? Every kafir on the street, if you go and ask them, is there an open heart surgery, would they believe it? Have they seen it? They believe that. Right? But when the Quran tells us something, when the Prophet ﷺ tells us the Ajud Ma'ajud exist, where could they exist? I haven't seen them. Have you seen it on Google Maps? Ajud Ma'ajud location. No results. It can't be. Weakness of Iman. Weakness of Iman. A doctor tells you something, it is na'udhu billah today as if the Quran has revealed about it. I'm not saying don't listen to your doctors. Right? I'm not anti-doctor. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to offend any MDs and stuff. Right? But I'm just saying, the Quran is a haq. He has more haq. The Quran has more right that we obey it and believe in it. The Prophet والسلام, and when he tells us in a sahih hadith something, it has more right upon the Muslim that we believe in it than what we see on TV, than what we see with our own eyes, than what a doctor tells us, than anybody else tells us. Right? So this is something amazing. Those Orientalists that made fun of this, if they were alive today, they would have been mocked. But the Orientalists today mock us for things, and inshallah in a few years when they see it, they will be mocked for it as well. And if not in this dunya, there is the akhirah. When Halima went back and she saw the Prophet ﷺ, she saw that the color of his face had changed. And he sat up and there was a mark. This is not imagination. There was a mark where the chest had been opened. And she saw it and she reported it. Anas ibn Malik, he's in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ narrates his hadith to him. And he says, I saw the stitch mark of the needle. Mikhyat, okay. this is where the needle would be. Okay. Now, what does that exactly mean? Wallahu okay. Was it like stitching? Was it like a slice? Wallahu okay. But that mark was still there in Medina after Hijra when Anas ibn Malik anhu, first hand report saw it. Tayyib, this is where we're at. I will just mention something in brief, which is how many times was the chest of the Prophet ﷺ opened? Twice. Twice? Three? Four? Five? Anybody? Most people only know about one. Ibn Hajar mentions five. Out of the five, one of them I found no sanad for. So I just, let's put that aside. Four I found in the books of Hadith. Two of them in Bukhari and Muslim. Yani in Bukhari and Muslim. One of them in, in Muslim as the one we just mentioned. At the age of four years of age. One of them in Al-Bukhari, which is at the time of Isra al-Mi'raj. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was about 50 years of age. Okay? So these two, no doubt to their authenticity. There are two more. One is at the age of 10 years. And this is in the Muslim Imam Ahmad and Ibn Asakir and others have mentioned it. And one of them being when he got Nabuwa, when he got the prophethood, Abu Nu'aym and others, Abd Sa'ad and others have mentioned this. The narration about prophethood, no doubt it's weak. There is weakness in that narration. The narration about the, at the age of 10, we will discuss. But at least twice we can say no doubt from authentic ahadith from the Prophet Wasallam and the Sahaba and eyewitness accounts. Tayyib. Here, after this incident, after four years of age, this time Halima became afraid. She loved having the barakah of the Prophet ﷺ around her, but she became afraid. Because she realized that what if he gets killed? 
And what if some jinn or some other creation kills him? Or the people like the Yahud or other kill him? It would be her responsibility. She did not want that on her head because she loved the Prophet ﷺ. She saw the great akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ, even as a child. Some people say, oh, it's not fair. Why was that thing taken out of the heart of the Prophet ﷺ and not mine and so on? Because he was worthy of it. Because Allah saw him worthy of it. Make yourself worthy. Cleanse your heart yourself. But this is the problem. We are, we are not those people. We just want excuse after excuse to sin. So, seeing this beautiful uh, child and worrying about him, she decided to return. This is a weak narration that on the way back he was lost and the family of Sufyan found him. But again, those are weak narrations, so I skip most of those just to rely upon the authentic narrations. When he came back to his mother Amina, and this is yani, after the fourth year of his life, Amina wanted to visit her husband's grave. Where did her husband die? Abdullah. Huh? In Medina, on the outskirts of Medina. And she loved her husband. And this is from the yani, love of a woman that even after the death of her husband, she loves him. You find many brothers the same way. Even after the death of their wife, they love their wife. And they want to honor them. And the Prophet ﷺ was like this. He used to honor the, the friends of Khatija anha and send them gifts and things, even after his death, even after Hijrah. So she wanted to go visit the grave of her husband. Now, before I go on, I, I had mentioned this, but I want to clarify. We don't take ahkam from this time period. This is time of Jahliya, this is before Nabuwa. Okay. So we don't want the people to be like, ah, she was at the grave, so what, why are you stopping women from visiting graves, right? Ah, she went to Medina by herself, which again, uh, the narration she did not, but anyway. So what's wrong? Understand, this is before Nabuwa. So don't try to twist things, right? Regarding visit, yani, women visiting graves, there are yani, four, or you can say three aqwal of ulema. One of them, if we take all four of them, one of them that it is mustahab, like it is for men. Okay? One of them that it is mubah, it is permissible. Some of them said it is mutlak and haram. And this is the call of Sheikh Ibn Abbas. And one of them, which is the rajih, what is correct, is that it is not something that should regularly be done, but under certain conditions that it is permissible. And that is the call of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen. Tayyip, the hadith that people use to show that it is permissible, they mention the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that I used to forbid you from visiting the graves, but now I give you permission. But this is aam, this is general for men and women. Right? We're not discussing aam, we're discussing something general. There is the hadith that yani, there is a great reminder in visiting the graves, and Rasulullah sallallahu encouraged the people, but again those are all aam. The khas, the clear hadith that is Imam Al-Tirmidhi has mentioned and it is sahih is la'an Allah, that there is a la'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the rawayat of the Maja, la'an of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for zawarat al-qubur, for those women that often visit the qabr, la'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon it, right? So this hadith is sahih and it is very clear. But as Shaykh Ibn Uthameen mentioned that if somebody Occasionally visited, they would not come under zawarat because this is this is what they call al jins. Al jins hana, yani sadr al kathiran, yani it shows something that happens a lot. That's why you call it the jins, right? Meaning, uh, if if ism fa'il is different. For example, somebody, uh, yani sells something occasionally, yani you don't call you just say he he sells it. But if you are like he is the utter man, yani as Abdul Razak is, right? He is the other guy, right? That means that he's so well known and he does it so much and he's so good at it that you give the sifa to him himself, not just the ism fa'il. Right? So anyway, I'm not going to go deep there, but this is the understanding. Tayyib. But I will mention some of the, the uh, shurut. One, it should not be regularly. Like, like every janaza and every time or on a regular basis, women going to the qubur, la. This is forbidden. It should not be where there is mixing of men and women. 
Today, even at Janaz, you see mixing of men and women. Astaghfirullah. Yani, the Janazah has become a place of fitna for us. And this is something sad. Hassan al-Basri saw somebody eating in the maqbara. He said, this person has forgotten death. His heart is dead. How can he be at a maqbara? He sees the dead and he's eating. Today we go to a janazah, people are joking. People are mixing. People are yani, spending days there hanging out and talking about other things. So there should no be no mixing of men and women. It should not be in a way of bid'ah or shirk. I mean, people go to the qubur and do bid'ah and shirk. Obviously, mutlaqan, that's haram. A person should not travel to go to the grave of anybody. You don't take on a travel to visit qubur. Right? The only three places you can travel for barakah, for reward, is Masjid al-Haram, Masjid al-Nabi, alayhi salatu salam, Masjid al-Aqsa. Rasulullah said, do not take on a travel illa thalatha. He didn't say, don't travel to a masjid illa thalatha. These people have made idraj. They add their own wording into the hadith. 